Who have you got hidden in that cupboard under the stairs? Uh, uh, a load of boxes and carrier bags. OK, just checking. Always worth checking. Well, joining us now, Dr Simon Clark, who's a microbiologist at the University of Reading. Um, you've been looking at the cost of this and, and the pandemic specifically. What, what, what would you put the cost at? Good afternoon. Well, the, the cost is, is uh, in people not being able to go to work. Um, I'm not quite sure what that would be in absolute pounds and pence, but it would be billions. Um, but there is also this other thing we've got to take into consideration, um, which is the potential spread of the virus. And uh, we don't actually know how many people get ping, who get pinged are uh, carrying the virus. But the Office for National Statistics told us last week that a third of people actually get sick. So when you add on to that the number of people who will be carrying the virus asymptomatically and could spread it on to somebody else to uh, make them sick, then there's a potential cost with that as well. Uh, do you think that, I mean, look, we, we are still trying to figure out whether we are safe to open up fully, even though we almost have done, um, and that hopefully the vaccine is going to break the chain between catching COVID and serious illness. But surely if people are vaccinated, now we're being asked potentially to present vaccine passports to go to places, then it should apply if you're double vaccinated and get pinged. It doesn't, this doesn't add up to me. Uh, well, um, the, the government's uh, uh, idea that you need to, uh, to, to isolate for 10 days after you've been pinged or after, in fact, not after you've been pinged, after you've come into contact with somebody who makes you be pinged, um, th that, that's, that's out of date. That, that they, they shouldn't be doing that. I mean, we've been, uh, until very recently, um, been operating a test to release program where people who've come back from amber countries have been able to take a PCR test five days after they come back. And if that's clear, then they can, can carry on with life. And I see no reason why something similar shouldn't operate. But of course, you won't have a, a, a useful PCR test a day or two after potentially getting infected because almost certainly, well, no, in fact, certainly, you won't get, your test won't pick up any infection you've got uh, because your body won't have produced enough virus. So um, these things need to be taken in some sort of balance. And it's also worth remembering that double vaccination only reduces your chances of getting infected and passing it on to somebody else. It doesn't eliminate them. And that reduction is nowhere near as big as the reduction you get in, uh, in the, the sort of... Um, protecting you against the most fatal disease. If it's all right on August the 16th to do this, why isn't it all right to just say, do it from now? That's a really good question. I think, but I don't know that it's because there isn't uh, sufficient testing capacity available at the moment. My understanding is that the government are trying to stand some of that up, but that's just sort of gossip I hear on the grapevine. So my suspicion is that we, right today, don't have enough testing capacity. And, I mean, do you think that we should get to the stage soon that we move on with our lives? Once we've got the most vulnerable people vaccinated, and, and surely we're, we've got to be close to getting most people vaccinated who need to be vaccinated at this point, we can't go around hiding from a virus or trying to sweep it under the carpet forever. Well, we've got just over two-thirds of the population um, double vaccinated. Uh, it, the, the rates there, unfortunately, are slowing down. But uh, it really does depend on what happens next, what variants we get, if any. It's not guaranteed that we'll get any, any really uh, nasty variants in future, but it is entirely possible. Um, it, you know, you, you, you get people on the news like yourself get all sorts of predictions and all sorts of people coming on saying they know what's going to happen next. They don't. Um, nobody does. So we've just got to sit tight, um, do our best now and wait to see what happens in the future. I'm interested in, in this grapevine that you, you, you're talking to. I'm just wondering what else that we don't know in the media that you're all talking about, which means we'll be talking about it in a week or so. Oh, well, my, my grapevine is sort of scientists predicting things and gossiping about data, arguing about data often. Uh, your grapevine, of course, will be politicians who are the real ones that make the decisions. So I wouldn't hear it worry from the about too much. I, so come on, I'd, I'd rather hear it from you. What, 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 what's the theory? What, what, what are people, is there a particular worry that, that hasn't been expressed yet? Um, I think there are some concerns about how long 
uh, immunity to the vaccine will last. And I've seen some interesting stuff from Israel this morning and um, how well it will actually stand up to full uh, full force untrammeled transmission in society which we've never had before so the protection numbers that we we have the 90 odd percent protection against the most lethal forms of disease might not be as quite as high as uh, 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 government information has uh, led us to believe but that remains to be seen i mean it might might be all okay do you think if you had a crystal ball, it would tell you that in the near enough future, we'll have essentially beaten COVID and be back to normal? Or is that years away? I think that's years away. On a global scale, it is certainly years away. Uh, we may have got our lives substantially back to normal, but we'll be living with this for some time. It will be impinging on our lives for some time. But I think even today, um, our lives are substantially back to normal possibly not true for everybody, but for most people it is. So um, while there are uh, possibilities of inconveniences uh, between now and the end of the year, I think certainly between September and the end of the year, um, then, uh, you know, that, that, that could come back to haunt us, could come back to bite us. But uh, that remains to be seen. I think you meant to say impinging on, on our lives. <laughs> um, I... I... <laughs> I know, I'm here all week. Um, I, I just <laughs> wondered, when people say, you know, here we are with 618,000 alerts being sent to users in England and Wales in the week to the 14th of July, is that because the app is getting more effective or is it simply that there are more cases? Well, I can't comment on whether the app is getting more or less effective because the government changed parameters in it and often don't tell us or tell us after the well after the event. But really, it is happening because the increasing numbers of pings are happening because more people are getting infected. Um, of course, there will be some people, plenty of people, who get pinged but not infected. But um, uh, currently, there's not a lot can, that can be done about that. Um, these these. Uh, pings as we keep calling them will uh, will inevitably pick up a lot of people that have been infected as well you were directly advising the government would you say that yes this scheme is good it's successful keep it on would you say actually it's pointless we shouldn't be looking at cases um, what what would your advice be right now well, I'd say we do need to look at cases, unfortunately, because it gives us uh, an idea of the, the magnitude of infection in society. And that gives you an idea of what's coming within the next few weeks in terms of hospital admissions. Because I think this time around, although people aren't dying in such large numbers, the pressure that it puts on hospitals, the space it takes up in them, meaning that your normal elective surgeries and, and procedures can't go ahead or they become more difficult, is the real problem this time round. Simon, do we know if the, the virus thrives or dislikes this, this sort of wave of hot weather? Is that, is that bad for, for spreading a virus? Uh, well, there is a theory that this is seasonal and it will be worse during the winter. But of course, uh, this time last year, July last year, there was a, a, a problem in the southern United States, in Florida and California. And those places are not cold at this time of year. Brazil is not a cold country, but has problems. Um, and in the past, the virus has thrived in places like Singapore, which is almost on the equator. So I really do think that uh, while I understand the, the hypothesis, if you like, the idea that this might be seasonal and is always worse in the winter, I don't think it can really be stood up yet. It may well be true, but it might not. And in, in terms now of what we should be doing individually to try and, you know, protect ourselves and our families, uh, would you recommend continuing with social distancing or not seeing relatives? I mean, what, what should we be doing? Well, not seeing people and not mixing with people is the only real way you can guarantee that you're not going to get it. Um, you know, it is increasingly common, it seems, in the population. Um, so there is a, a very real chance, even if you've been double vaccinated, that you'll be, um, you know, you could be infected. Uh, if you've been double vaccinated, of course, your chances of getting infected are decreased, they decrease, your chances of being ill are substantially decreased, your, your chances of getting fatally ill, being in hospital, are massively decreased. Um, but they're not eliminated, they're not zero.
Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.